So I'll kick it off. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Danielle Crocker. My pronouns are she, her. Uh, I'm the Associate Director of Employer Engagement here at the DePaul Career Center. And I have the pleasure of being joined by uh, a team from Play Fair Data, as well as Kelly Rao uh, from uh, uh, the Kelstat Business Analytics Organization. And he's also a current grad student. So I, with that, I will let Kelly take it away. Sure, thank you, Danielle. Um, so uh, as Danielle mentioned, uh, and thank you so much, Danielle, for putting this together, as well as folks from Playfair for uh, making this happen. Um, and uh, as Danielle mentioned, I'm Kelly, I'm currently a grad student, and um, I'm really excited to be moderating this event. Uh, and I hope everyone you know, has a take home from this that they can use in their career search or their own personal data visualization projects. And uh, yeah, now I'll hand it over to the Playfair team to introduce themselves. Cool. Hi, everyone. Um, I can go ahead and share. Yeah, great. Let's see. Okay, let me know if everyone can see my screen. Yeah, I've got it. I guess we can start with um, just introductions of who we are. Yeah, I can kick things off. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ethan Lang. I'm the Associate Director of Analytics Engineering at Playfair Data. Um, I studied at KU um, University, the University of Kansas. And what got me started in, into or interested in data visualization I originally signed up for the School of Engineering um, doing computer science, and I took a statistics class during that program. And that kind of opened my eyes to the power of data and statistics, especially data visualization and how it could impact um, both the world and um, business. Um, so that's what got me started. I eventually switched my, um, uh, my major into business analytics. Um, so I got my undergrad in business analytics which was a program that specialized in data visualization and uh, predictive modeling. And then later I got my master's. I actually just graduated um, several weeks ago with my master's um, in uh, statistics from KU Med, which is the med school here in, in the University of Kansas. I can go next. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Maggie Mulner. I'm a senior regional analytics associate at Playfair. Um, I actually report to Ethan, so Ethan's my boss. Um, I have an undergrad degree from a English speaking university in Austria in business and management. And I am doing my final months of my grad degree in business computer science at the IU in Germany, but everything's online. I got into data, I think around three years ago in the last semesters of my undergrad degree, also because of the stats classes. Um, I fell in love with those. Uh, we used SPSS the first time in my life. Um, had lots of fun doing that, but kind of missed a more visual and design approach of that. Um, so I got into Power BI and Tableau at that point, and the rest is history. Now I'm a playfer. <laughs> That's cool. Um, hi, my name is Jason Penrod. I'm the Director of Information Design at Playfair. Um, and I, my university was Northern Arizona University, uh, where I studied photography um, and uh, also had a minor in business and a uh, minor in fine arts as well. Um, so I kind of grew up as a designer, artistic type. Um, I have a master's in liberal studies as well um, and ended up in Kansas City. I currently live in Kansas City. Um, and during that time, I've worked for a lot of different companies um, as a consultant and I also spent some time with Hallmark Cards, um, who's based here in Kansas City. Um, and that's really what got me interested. So to go from photography and, and kind of get into data is a little bit of an interesting route. And I think um, Hallmark and in Hallmark, um, I worked in an R&D group and we did a lot of different kinds of projects. So really got interested in data at that point and really kind of blurring the lines between um, sort of the art and the design of visual visualizations, and then um, also the technical um, side of the data itself. So uh, really enjoy both sides of that. Um, and that kind of helps today in, in what we do, which is you know a lot of interface design and visualization design, chart design, things like that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, been an interesting road, but a fun one, definitely. Yeah. 
Hi everyone, I'm the last one to introduce myself. I'm Rafael Simancas. I am the Visual Analytics Architect at Play for Data. I am actually a DePaul alumni. I graduated spring last year, 2021, and I majored in user experience design and uh, minor in information technology. And I got into data pretty much a year ago almost. I was during my senior year at DePaul that I took a class I believe it was called coding design frameworks um, and where we kind of played around with different uh, coding languages and uh, coding uh, data visualization libraries. So it was there that I started doing some projects uh, through various topics uh, like fracking and epidemics that I really got into enjoying the, that, the, that level of research and story or and thought that goes into storytelling using data visualization elements. So after that, right before I, I was about to graduate, I actually stumbled upon Play for Data really by chance. Um, I was like at the right place at the right time when they needed someone. And I just knew it was like the perfect fit because I always liked the design uh, side of things pretty much like Jason said, but I always had an interest in delving into a little bit more um, a job that would require a lot, a lot more I guess, technical or uh, level of literacy to work. So um, I guess we wanna talk a little bit about what Play for Data is and what our company is, I guess, before we get into the interesting stuff of data. Yeah, I, I can kind of start here and anybody else feel free to chime in if, uh, if you feel like it. Um, yeah, I think Playfair, we're a bit unique in the industry. Um, there's a lot of analytics companies um, out there, but uh, we're a consultancy that really serves um, folks looking to visualize uh, data. We can do a lot of data engineering um, and we primarily use Tableau as our sort of um, authoring interface uh, and then deliver out to Tableau Public or Tableau Server. Um, but we, we kind of specialize in the idea of bringing data to life um, and really looking at like sometimes very large data sets, uh, very complex data sets, and really trying to find value in those data sets for um, our customers. So a lot of what we'll show today and kind of talk about um, and kind of what we're known for in the industry is really not just giving you a Tableau dashboard, but really almost building it into an application of sorts and, and really looking to unlock sort of hidden gems in that data um, and, and finding the value for our customers. Um, and so, you know, the unique piece is really bringing a lot of UX uh, and design to uh, the dashboards and, and honestly, the, the web apps that we build. Um, that that's sort of the unique thing that we bring to it that you don't find that often out in the industry. So when you look at our dashboards, a lot of times you can't tell that they're built in a particular tool, um, especially Tableau. Um, so I think that's sort of what we, we do. The kinds of companies that we work for we really stretches the gamut from healthcare um, to automotive to marketing. Um, so, you know, that's another really interesting piece about the company is we do work not just in a particular vertical, we, we work across a lot of different verticals um, when it comes to the, the customers that we serve. Does anyone want to add anything else or? I think Jason nailed it. Uh, we can probably move on to the next slide there. Okay. Yeah, I can touch on this one a little bit. Um, so who we work with, it's, it's really, we work with all kinds of different partners, um, anywhere from different industries. Uh, you can see some listed here, automotive, healthcare, media, advertising, um, but uh, also different ranges of business. Um, so we work from anywhere from the local nonprofit here in Kansas City, um, maybe some, someone we just met at the coffee shop, um, all the way up to some of the Fortune, you know, 100, uh, Fortune 10 companies in, in the world. Um, and we do business with, you know, clients all over the world as well. So um, quite, a, quite a bit of range as far as who we work with. Um, obviously, we have different kind of intro level. Um, uh, we call them pilot projects, but that's where we'll kind of go in um, and really narrow into one individual issue that they're having or a problem that they're trying to solve. And we kind of help them out through that. Um, we also do extended partnerships uh, where we'll take some of our team members and embed them 
um, into a team um, at that company. So um, different industries, different ways that we can engage with them. Um, and yeah, anyone else have anything to add on that? Yeah, I think that's really good. Uh, yeah. I only have one. I feel it, it's important to say that we don't only focus on consulting. We do have like a second leg that is also focused on training. Mm. So uh, one portion um, every couple months due to COVID, we switched over to online training. But we also did in-person training previously, either to groups or to individual like company groups, um, anything in that range as well um, to just teach people Tableau. Yep. Thanks for that, Maggie. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, really great introduction. Um, and so moving on, uh, Jason, I believe you mentioned you work with a wide variety of clients in different industries. Um, and so we know that uh, from a business perspective, from a storytelling perspective and a design perspective, uh, each of them have very different, different implications when you build out a dashboard for these firms. Uh, and so um, maybe if uh, any of you guys want to take a shot at this, if you could tell us, uh, you know, what um, the, uh, you know, like uh, strategy for Playfair is going into uh, thinking about the business use case, the storytelling and the design for uh, one or some of these projects. Yeah, I can, I can definitely start um, with an answer and I'm sure others will chime in. Um, yeah, it, it is very interesting. I mean, it's very exciting to work on such different industries, but with that comes the challenge of sometimes having to learn an industry very quickly. Um, you know, like uh, for instance, a recent one was a company that works in the capital market. So that's essentially, you know, they buy and sell like loans essentially on a market, you know, in a marketplace. Um, and there's a lot of um, language that goes with that kind of an industry, um, very industry specific language. Um, so, I mean, in the beginning, I know we have like an initial kind of meeting with, the, with our stakeholder, or our client, um, and we have a chance to kind of, you know, hear from them and really try to understand what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and I think that's kind of like the, the key piece is the team is really kind of key to the whole thing. Um, I think the thing that we have at Playfair that's really special is that we all work very well together. Um, there's not one person, you know, who's going to do something without the other people kind of knowing about it. We really do communicate a lot. And I, I just kind of stress that as, you know, our culture is one of sort of a flat organization where we, there's no, there's no real, you know, boss or hierarchy to any of it. We all have a role to play. Um, and I think go, when you, you, we have to work that way. When we go into a, a brand new industry that none of us has worked on, um, you really have to do some research. You have to ask some good questions in the beginning. Um, you have to really understand what the client is trying to accomplish. Um, a lot of times we're asking for data, but we won't have data right up front. So it's a lot of research into, you know, whatever market it is or whatever industry it is. Um, and in that case, you know, I start with, you know, like you probably start a research paper and just do a lot of research and try to figure out what's the gist of, of you know, financial market industry. What's the, what's the thing that's happening there? Um, at the end of the day, usually things are, you know, you can really simplify things down to most companies are trying to either, they're, they're all trying to make money and they're trying to do it through like sort of expanding um, the, the sort of you know, money making side of the business or trying to find efficiencies in what it costs to make whatever they make. So you kind of kind of land in one of those two buckets. Sometimes it's, it can even be a blend of those two things. But I think really trying to break everything down into that framework and understand what's the goal. Um, are we working on trying to kind of increase sales or are we working on sort of making things more efficient on the, on the cost side of things? Um, once we know that and we kind of get the lingo down, we'll have then another interview session and really be able to kind of ask more pointed questions, um, make sure that we understand lingo and things like that. But you know, it's it's definitely um, not an easy thing every time, and it takes it takes a little bit of time to kind of get our heads wrapped around new industries. Um, but one, the cool thing is, once we have that kind of an industry in our in our tool belt, then it's pretty easy to go and apply that to other um, customers as well. Yeah, the Thank team. You, Jason. Yeah. Uh, to build on that, I feel like that the discovery phase is what what makes it really successful because it's quite extensive. And also, like from a Tableau perspective, just sitting in those discovery phases, telling or sitting there with stakeholders, trying to gain what they really need 
and versus what they think they need sometimes. Um, for one ex for one example was they wanted one dashboard showing X, Y, and Z, but we ended up with five different views um, to nail down exactly what was their need um, to what Jason mentioned, like what what um, our measures to cost save, what makes them more efficient, but there it's not like one answer. You have to dig into it. It might be very structural where it goes down a hierarchy um, with different profit levels or different expenses that we can save on. But in order to get that insight, you need to understand and do your research at first pretty thoroughly. And those discovery sessions can last like from two meetings, three meetings, four meetings, even five meetings and involve from three people to five stakeholders, but sometimes even more. So it's, it's very extensive, but definitely pays off in the long run. Great, thank you for that answer. And so you kind of touched on the discovery phase. Uh, I, I am sure the audience would love to know as I would, um, what goes into selecting your data source and how uh, do you kind of translate that into a cohesive narrative after kind of looking at the data and seeing how it's laid out? Yeah, I'd say it depends on the client. Um, you know, some, some individuals will have their data set kind of already curated um, and it's very simple to kind of pick up on that, um, look through the schema, uh, which is just the measures and dimensions that are included within that data set and then kind of build upon that. Obviously um, to kind of develop the story, um, a lot of that discovery conversation will help navigate that. Um, and then as we dive into the data, you know, those kind of insights that bubble up when you start visualizing data um, can sometimes be very telling, especially if, you know, if, if folks have been looking at data, maybe in a raw data table, uh, once you start visualizing it, it really starts, that story starts coming together. Um, so it just depends. Uh, I know that's kind of a vague answer. I hate to do vague answers, but it truly does depend. Um, other times, you know, clients will come to us with a, a business problem and it's up to us to go out into the world and find that data. Um, you know, there's all kinds of different public data sets out there um, that we can pull upon um, from reputable um, institutions. Um, so we have had that happen in the past as well, uh, where they kind of come to us with a business problem and kind of present it to us. And then it's up to us to kind of go out and see if we can find the data needed to kind of solve that, that issue. Um, team, anybody else on that one? Um, sometimes we also like create our own data schema of what our wished uh, measures and dimensions are and give that back to them. So if they have not prepared data set or don't know yet where to curate the data um, during the discovery phase or also the first steps of the wireframe or design phase, Jason will come back and says, oh, I need X, Y, and Z measure and I need X, Y, and Z dimension. Mm -hmm. So we map it out, we create a matrix for them and kind of tell them this is the ideal state. Where, how can we get there? Where do we need to go? Yep. Great, thank you. Um, another kind of question, and this kind of uh, comes down to a little bit of business versus creativity. Uh, one would be how closely does the design team uh, with uh, UI UX and the uh, team developing the dashboards work and how does that collaboration look like? I'd love to hear about that. I can touch on that. Uh, I know the whole team can touch on that. It's uh, one of our favorite topics. Jason hit it on the head earlier. Um, we really have open communication. Our team is so light and nimble. It's very flat um, and that works very well for us. Um, so when it comes to that, you know, I know that I'm not the most creative person on the team. So I'm gonna lean on Jason. Um, and then again, you know, like he knows like if he has like a technical issue he's trying to think through, he can always come to me or Maggie um, for that insight. Um, so it is truly knowing our own strengths and weaknesses, but I would say more importantly, knowing our own individual weaknesses. Um, that way I'm, I'm not going to spend, you know, 100 hours trying to prototype something, you know, when I know that Jason and Raphael can knock that out in like five minutes. <laughs> um, so it is very important to us, that collaboration, um, and it, it's what makes our, our product so unique, um, in my opinion. Yeah, I would, I would, I would sort of say the same thing. I mean, even between designers like Rafa and I today, I mean, we've really got a nice way of kind of even putting a second set of eyes on each of our work. 
you know, and I know you got the engineers do that as well. So I think it's one, it's that ego free kind of space. It's a really safe, like, I'm not going to feel dumb if I have to ask a question, um, you know, and, and I know there's others on the team that can do it better than I can. So I'm not trying to like, you know, do everything. Um, and I think as soon as you can get to that kind of a, a culture, um, again, like Ethan said, you can move quickly, you can be nimble. Um, you know, if I'm working on something and I, I have a problem, then I can go to Rafa and say, hey, you know, what about this? You know, and in five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes in Figma, we can like have a quick conversation, get a couple of solutions and then go put it and implement it in, into a tool. So it's just that really fluid, um, you know, kind of communication between everybody and, and everybody comes to the table pretty ego free and we all have that same goal in mind at the end. And just to add one more thing to that, sorry, I'm, I'm passionate about this subject. Okay. Sure. Um, but one other thing to that, like a lot of times what makes our magic happen, you know, like Jason and Raphael, because they're in this kind of creative mindset, will dream something up that isn't really necessarily out of the box, that it's not necessarily something that's been solved before. So it keeps Maggie and I um, very innovative because um, we have to kind of come to the table, think through it technically, like, can we build that? And you know we're going to strive to get it done. Um, so it keeps our products very innovative. Um, it keeps us, you know, on our toes and out in the forefront. Um, you know, when we're we're kind of building through these new products that Raphael and Jason have kind of dreamed up. Yeah, uh, I I think just adding to everything everyone said, it's not necessarily a linear project. Really, when we start with a client, everyone is involved in that kickoff meeting, and there are going to be stages where potentially engineers are going to be more involved than a designer would be in that at that stage in time. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, you really kind of like Ethan said, it's really a back and forth communication. Uh, for me, you know, for Jason and I, we're usually the designers. So usually take the first crack at trying to figure out what the solution is going to look like and how it's going to function. But in order for us to do that, we have to see the data. So we have to talk to our engineers to make sure that the data fits our, uh, the data is prepared to handle the design that we have in mind, but they also need to make sure that the data is going to able to, so it's just like a two-way street, basically, what I'm trying to say. And it's the only way that you can work this. You, you cannot, you, you need, as, especially speaking for my position as a designer, you can't, you, it's not, going to be very uh, good for you or your team to try to design something without knowing the limitations of everyone else in your team. So by knowing kind of how Ethan said, being able to go back to him and uh, just trying to figure out, you know, what can be done. And I'll try to like shoot a design that's going to uh, fall within that range. Uh, it's that's the sweet spot that we're looking at. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So I know Jason mentioned Figma and you guys all talked about the kind of journey from the kickoff meeting throughout the project. Uh, what are some of the tools and if possible, uh, if you could share some examples with everyone on this call uh, of uh, how you kind of walked through this entire process and journey, um, for example, Figma or Tableau. Uh, I can kick us off here. So I also use um, Alteryx to do data prep. And for me, how that process often looks like is, first of all, getting access to a lot of data sources, which can take days, um, depending on how tight securities are at different companies. But um, once I have that, it, it actually starts in getting used to what that table looks like, what it entails, um, what, what we need for the dashboard, and then bringing it into a format that actually works for Tableau. Because Tableau is, as a software, also pretty picky about what it likes and what it can do and might need different data for different uh, visualizations. So normally we try to like make it thin and stack it underneath each other. Um, longer is probably performance-wise better than wider. But for a specific chart types like a Sankey, you have to keep in mind that needs a complete completely different data set. So knowing what the chart needs from a data perspective and combining Tableau and data engineering at that time is really a sweet spot for me to make sure I have everything in the end that I need for Tableau. Great. Uh, just to kind of follow up on that, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of um, planning for uh, 
you're planning your data selection based on your chart type. Um, how does that look and how is that impacted by any changes that might be requested down the road? Yeah, so as Rafa said, it's not really linear. Um, a lot of times you go back to the drawing board and go back to the data source and find different fields or columns that you need. Um, it, it is a moving target in the end, unless you have like very down um, targets. But um, I would say it's just be flexible. Like we can always go back and change something very, very quickly. Um, all tricks is super fast. It doesn't require you to write any SQL code that might take you forever. So that is definitely a benefit of that. Um, same with Tableau prep. It's much more vi visual, so you can manipulate the data much, much easier to a format that works for Tableau. Awesome. Thank you, Maggie. Um, if uh, you guys have any um, examples for Figma or uh, Tableau that you'd like to present, we'd love to see what you guys have. Sure, I can go ahead and share my screen real quick. So basically, uh, what we're trying to show you here is one of the, like Maggie said, one of the various services that we offer. A lot of the times, we're mainly working on Tableau to get a dashboard to our clients. So they come to us with a problem. And, you know, most of these companies, they've magic magically survived relying only on spreadsheets and Excel. So we're really trying to bring them into the world of Tableau and data visualization to be able to draw insights in a more uh, logical way, but also in a way that's more, yeah, at the end of the day, is going to bring them the most uh, benefits. Uh, this is actually one of our portfolio pieces. So this is something that we did on our own time in the company to kind of show, give an idea of what we can build. So right now, what you're looking at is a food access dashboard. So this was a public data set where we're looking at the areas in the US that have very low uh, food access. And that means that it's very hard for them to kind of access uh, locations like grocery stores, uh, chains, or anything where they can get their food at. And that there's a barrier between getting from point A to point B. So that might be very poor neighborhoods that don't have uh, that the population doesn't really have access to their own car or even sidewalks or uh, public transportation to get there. So this is one of the dashboards that we build. What we really do is that we get together, we try to look at the data, we make a lot of sketches using Figma, which is a proto uh, prototype software where uh, really the sky is the limit. You can really mock uh, a great amount of things using Figma. And while using Figma, we actually come up with this design and then we hand it off to the engineers and we, we put the pieces together. Um, so it was a very, this was a very nice project that we did just to give you an idea of how our deliverables might look like. And kind of like Jason said, most of the time, it really doesn't necessarily look like something that you see very often in Tableau. Uh, it doesn't look just like a report. It actually looks like an application that you can use. And I'll bring, this is actually in our Tableau public. So I'll actually drop the link in the chat in a few seconds so that um, you guys, if you're interested, you can go in and kind of see how the interaction of this works. We have another uh, example that we can show you right now. And that is an optimization dashboard, which is an internal tool that we've recently created. And we're actually still in the process of engineering this and making uh, little tricks to make it better. Um, Jason or Ethan, would you like to talk a little bit more about this specific tool? Yeah, I can touch on that one. Um, so really the idea here, um, a lot of businesses will create their own dashboards and there's kind of a unique problem that we've run into in the past where uh, they've built something, it's, it's fantastic, it's a great dashboard, but it, it can be really slow, especially for the audiences trying to consume that information from the dashboard. Um, the way I always kind of like to think about it is, you know, like a C-suite individual, um, if it takes longer than five seconds for them to kind of come to the insight that they're looking for, that's probably too long for them. Uh, working back from that, if it's kind of a mid-level manager, you know, maybe 10 seconds is reasonable for that audience. Then again, someone that's diving into the, to the data very deeply, 
um, maybe someone like an analyst or something like that, if they're, you know, they can probably, their tolerance is maybe even over 30 seconds, you know, if the screen is loading for 30 seconds, um, that might be okay for that audience. So what this dashboard does is we can take a dashboard and apply a lot of the techniques that we've just kind of learned over time and improve the speed and optimization of that tool. And then this dashboard tracks all of those improvements we've made on the individual page level um, and interaction. Um, so for every interaction, if you, if you click and the tool loads, um, we can track that time that it takes to load that, that particular click. Um, and then we're optimizing that. So what you see here in the main dashboard um, is a, an example of where we've kind of come in and all the, the dots and these bullet charts to the far right would represent um, the baseline. That's where the dashboard was as far as the average time spent for that interaction. And then all of the, the lighter blue dots to the far left in that uh, dumbbell chart, um, those are gonna be what the, the time um, that it took to load after we've come through and kind of improved the performance on that dashboard. Uh, we can take all of those individual interactions and we kind of roll them up into, you know, average time saved and we can calculate out these percentages, which you see um, moving to the right there in the middle. Um, and then we have some other key KPIs here um, to the far right that kind of looks at overall performance um, for the entire tool um, and the, the time saved and the percent of time saved um, for those interactions for the tool as a whole. Um, so we kind of break it down to individual interaction and then kind of roll it up as we move to the right. Uh, but this is just another example that we want to kind of preview with you guys. Um, and as far as how we built it, um, you know, I think we've kind of touched on it a little bit. Um, but again, just to kind of emphasize it, it kind of starts in this prototype phase where, you know, we kind of meet as a team, talk through uh, maybe the end goal or the, or the business problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and then from there, we open up a tool like Figma where we can start prototyping. Uh, once the team or the designers have a good prototype, they'll pass off what we call a wireframe um, to the engineers, uh, one that's kind of populated with data. Um, so we'll have kind of mock charts, mock data um, that kind of just shows us what they had in mind. Um, and then a blank one, uh, one that we need to populate. Yeah, perfect. Uh, this is awesome. Yeah, so what you see here in the middle, this is kind of our blank wireframe and we'll stick this in the tool and this is what we're building around. It's our architecture, if you will. Um, and then we kind of have the blueprint, um, which is over here to the, I think to the left or the right. Um, and this is kind of that mock data set that you know the designers have plugged in to kind of give us an idea of how it should look and how it should be visualized on the screen. Um, at this point, once we kind of have that, that wireframe, as the technical engineers on the on the team, you know, Maggie and I will come through and kind of test out the feasibility. You know, like, can we do that? Um, is there a technical limitation that we're going to run into um, with those kinds of things? There may be a little bit of back and forth between the design team and technical team at that point, um, just to kind of refine some of those small uh, feasibility items. But after that, um, it'll come to the technical team, and we'll build it out um, using uh, live data. Um, and construct the tool and, and kind of push it into production from there. Great, thank you, Ethan. Uh, if anyone else wants to share about any of uh, the examples that uh, we just saw. I would, I would just add that the, we use Figma for a lot of, I mean, all of that prototyping work that we just saw, but mm -hmm. we also use it in a lot of the discovery phase as far as like user interviews. Um, you know, we do a lot of interviews of, of stakeholders and, and, you know, keeping notes. And again, I, I just kind of always plug Figma here because it's such a good software for collaboration. Um, you know, there's a lot of design software out there and, and some of it may, you know, most of them have some function of, of collaboration within them. I think in the way that we work and, and like having our engineers have access to the same Figma files that we all have, being able to kind of chat inside of those files, do quick things. Um, it's just such a good software, you know, of course for design, but beyond that, just for the collaborative sort of features that it offers. Um, and then on top of that, I'd just say there's just a ton of efficiency gains um, in keeping things consistent. Um, so using like, you know, UI kits or design systems, things like that, 
Um, it lets us move very quickly. It lets us keep things consistent from page to page. Um, so, you know, it, we really kind of hold ourselves to the same standard as, you know, an application developer or, you know, a, a big website developer might do in their work. We, we also use Figma in those very powerful ways to keep that, that work consistent and, you know, top notch and, and keep it efficient for all of us as well. So there's just a ton of uses for it beyond just making prototypes, but, um, you know, I think it, it's definitely a good tool to know and, and use. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I believe the presentation was also in Figma. Yeah, it was. If I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yep, we hate yeah. to go to PowerPoint. If we don't have to, we don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I was I think, gonna ask, sorry, go ahead, Raphael. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to add to that. I think Figma really became a very, uh, it's starting to become in the industry a very well, well used tool, I think mainly because ever since COVID, it really turned into our, uh, virtual office for everyone. And it's not something that only, like Jason said, not only the design team actually uses, uh, everyone else in the company has kind of either independently or because someone else in the company started using them, they got into Figma. So you would see Maggie or Ethan, even they might not be considered necessarily a designer in the eyes of the company, but they still t use Figma or any other similar prototyping tools to uh, play around with ideas that they have that they can pass on to us. So it's a very great tool to not only collaborate, but also share knowledge across teams. So kind of like Jason said, we use it for pretty much marketing. We can create our marketing content there. We also use it to create the wireframes, but also content for our blogs and images that we might create. A lot of the times we just, um, it's just our drawing room and our studio, our virtual studio. Yeah, that's amazing. I personally haven't had as extensive of an experience with Figma. My most uh, in-depth experience was building out a dashboard kind of frame in Figma and building out some, uh, I guess they call them components. Mm -hmm. But um, that's the extent of it. Uh, I We've had uh, a event where we had a speaker talk about Miro. What is the you know, like key differences between Miro and Figma, if any of you have a sense of that. I've used uh, Miro as well. And I, I think it is good. That's a great collaboration software. I, I think of it more in sort of um, like brainstorming, workshopping, things like that, where I'm going to collect, you know, maybe research, visual research. I'm going to have notes and, and post-it notes and things like that. Um, I don't know that it has quite the capabilities as far as like building prototypes, especially when it comes into some of the more technical features of Figma, like the, you know, the components, master components, you know, nesting different components, uh, all the things that make up sort of a design system, um, as well as, you know, especially actually even some of the auto layout stuff that lets you make designs that are responsive. Um, Figma is really second to none when it comes to coming up with responsive designs as well. Um, and I, I don't think Mural really offers much in that space. Um, so I, I, I would see that as the major difference. Definitely you can do a lot of brainstorming and workshopping and probably even um, some simple prototyping in, in Mural, but I think Figma hasn't beat as far as true prototype design. I think uh, I would even go as far as saying, I think one of the charms or one of the key elements that make Figma such a popular tool is that I think it really lets the audience or the user uh, decide what the tool is going to be for. Uh, if you see Miro, you you clearly tell you can clearly tell what the tool is made for. But in Figma, you can really use it for anything. There's really no limitations to what you can do with it. It's it's a tool that's open for anyone to use. It's very it has a very unlike other softwares like Adobe, uh, Tableau, Miro, or uh, Azure. It has a very uh, low curve, low learning curve. So you can become very, very, very proficient in Figma in a very short amount of time. And there's so much resources online. And that's something that even at Play for Data, we've kind of acknowledged how we've kind of unified our process around Figma. Like we've gone to the point that we really use it. Uh, I work on Figma every day. That's, that's really my virtual office. I don't do, I rarely do anything outside of it. And even then, you know, we even use it, I think, to archive documents. So we kind of use it sometimes as a, a version of our Google Drive, just to archive things. Uh, we use it to annotate uh, meetings, do uh, discovery, do sketches, do uh, image editing. So it's really, you can use it for anything. And I think 
that's the charm around it. It really helps you unify your entire company's process into one single tool instead of having different tools for different things. Yeah, that's amazing. The versatility of it seems to be the real catch there. Um, we've talked about Figma. Uh, maybe if we could talk about uh, Tableau a little bit, and um, uh, I'll probably pose this to Maggie. Uh, uh, could you explain to us a little bit about the level of detail in Tableau and you know some guidelines as to how to go about implementing level of detail? Yeah. So. A lot of the times when I get questions from the community, they are about level of detail. I want to say that it you don't have to know or understand level of detail in order to get a job in data. I don't think that's required. Level of detail can be super complex. It is also kind of a preference thing. A lot of the times for LODs, you can work around for with table calcs. Um, so it really comes down to your preference. I like... Uh, LOD is a little bit better. Um, they give me more security. They give me more um, kind of uh, control of what I want it to have. Um, and then also you have to differentiate between the three fix, include, or exclude LOD, which also you'll find once you start using them, you have a preference towards one of those or even two of those and might not use one of them at all. For me, that's exclude. I don't use exclude at all. Every time I try to use it, I fail at it. So I'm just going to stick with fixed. Um, and then also understanding the um, order of operations within Tableau. And I feel like that's such a basic thing, but I'm coming back to it every single day at work because an include LOD or a fixed LOD react differently. Um, fixed is much higher in the order of operations than include. So taking that into consideration when you put filters into the filters pane, your fixed LOD will not react to those unless it is in context. So I feel like those things are very good to know, but they're definitely not a requirement first when you start a job in data visualization. Awesome. And how quickly or how easily would you say are those skills that you could pick up? Uh, and do you have any resources or any suggestions as to where people can go to find some information on them? Definitely on blogs. Um, we use blogs on a daily basis, not only our own blog, but also blogs from, from different people in the data community. Um, there's a ton out of on there for LODs. For me, it was really understanding of what the LOD does, especially for fixed. If I have data on different levels of detail, and for example, you're mixing two data sources and one is much higher aggregated than the other, and I need to pull through a value of that aggregated one down to a lower one, I can fix it to that level and then it doesn't matter how far down I go, it will always show me that aggregated value. So just understanding use cases of where you, where you would need it is I think a good one. Um, for table calcs also, if you do a comparison between the, between like two months or so, um, instead of doing a table calc with a difference where you might as well add several dimensions to the calculation that might mess up your table calc, you can always go back and fixate your denominator to a specific level and it won't change on you. Great. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, and uh, last question before we head into uh, the Q&A session. Uh, Ethan, I'd love to ask you, I know you're very uh, proficient with table calculations. Um, and um, I just got to ask, what are your, uh, you know, most used, most frequent, most favorite table calculations in Tableau? Yeah, probably my most used uh, would be like the window sums, window average. Um, you can, you know, unlike an LOD where you're creating a calculation and fixing it to a specific level of detail within the view, Using a table calculation, you can have the view set to the level of detail and then apply a table calculation, which is going to look down the view or across the view and kind of sum those things up based on what's in the pane. Um, the advantage of that over an LOD, um, it doesn't have to calculate the entire data set. So when you create an LOD calculation, it's actually coming through the whole data set then producing your product with a window calc um, or a table calculation. It's only, only having to go through those aggregated values within your view. Um, so it can make it a little faster, 
Um, although LODs, you know, you can really get a precise answer, whereas your, your table calculation, if something changes in the view, it's gonna affect um, the overall output um, of that function. So there's advantages of both, I would say, for sure. Um, but yeah, I, I, I typically try to lean towards the table calculations versus the LODs. Um, LODs, you know, if something changes in the data, they can affect that calculation if the level of detail changes in the raw data. Uh, whereas a table calculation is a little bit more fluid. Like I said, if the window is set, then it will go um, and it will calculate out that, that um, calculation with whatever's in the window. Um, so there's benefits of both, um, yeah. Awesome, I love that we've came full circle from the examples that we were showing about optimization. Um, <laughs> you know, it's great to hear that. Uh, and I wanna thank you all. Uh, I really, I think everyone here appreciates uh, all the insights you provided. And uh, now we'd love to have anyone who has any questions, uh, ask our panelists from Playfair Data. Um, the floor is open. And uh, yeah, maybe uh, raising the hand if you have any questions and then we'll kind of go from there. Awesome, great, uh, April, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, I think April, I believe you And so I just wanted to, oh, sorry. Um, so you're, you're, I think it should be you're better now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Seems okay. Better. Yeah. Um, so I think I was saying I think Jason touched on um, responsive design in Figma, and I was just wondering if the data visualizations that you guys usually build are responsive or not. Sense. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question actually um you know figma is very good at, at responsive and i think you know for the most part um tableau is it's it's we really don't use its responsive features because it's a little bit unwieldy um you know there are ways of kind of using it and we use more of like a hybrid sort of approach to something so you know we can resize things and and use some of that inside tableau um i think the primary reason we still like to build things in sort of that responsive nature there's probably two reasons one is if i'm working on you know 50 dashboards this year um, i'm probably going to do a bar chart in each one of those um, and so if i can build one bar chart and make that a component that's you know you know going to have a lot of flexibility as far as its width its size and, and a lot of capability within that within figma then i'm going to build that once and then I'm going to use that same bar chart over and over and over in all my designs. And if I need it to be very small or make it, you know, a different color, it needs to be multiple rows. I, I have all those abilities. If I build the, the component within Figma in a smart way, that bar chart design is going to serve me well, you know, for a long time. That's probably the primary reason we do it. I think the secondary is more of a hope and a wish maybe is, is we, we keep seeing Tableau being updated uh, quite regularly and they're adding a lot to it. Um, and I, you know, my hope is that at some point we get some more sort of flexibility in the way that you author in Tableau. Um, I've done quite a bit of Tableau authoring and, and it can be really frustrating for a designer inside, you know, Tableau. There's just not many facilities for, um, you know, doing alignments and being able to kind of quickly and responsibly kind of change the size of something. Um, because what we do is so, you know, it's, it's very exacting. Um, a lot of times what we're working on is something that, you know, companies are going to rely on in a, in a kind of almost scary way. Uh, we tend to build them at a fixed size. Um, more times than not, it's in a 16 by nine. So if it's in a PowerPoint real nice, um, which, you know, interesting way to deliver things, but, you know, those are just things that we've learned and, you know, it doesn't really require that. If we have to, we do um, some mobile designs now. Um, we've done a couple of instances where we, you know, and Tableau does have some kind of clunky, but, you know, once you wrap your head around it, okay ways of handling uh, mobile. Um, we've done some of that work as well. So, you know, it might come in handy there, but the way that Tableau implements the mobile or, or multiple device kind of screens is still a little, you know, kind of weird. So we don't really, I wouldn't say we use that, like we would love to use it. Like I love Tableau to 
you know, come out with like, it's all CSS based, you know, I mean, that would be amazing. Um, you know, so fingers crossed. And if you guys all complain about it, maybe we'll get that one day. But, you know, so my hope is if we build all these great components that someday we'll be able to utilize those in the future in Tableau, um, like we'd like to, but uh, usually don't get to these days. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really familiar with Figma, but I've never used Tableau. So I was just interested in how that responsiveness sort of transfers. Yeah, I'll be curious what you think. If you get in there, you should definitely download the free version and, and make some stuff. Um, as a designer, I pulled my hair out. I know Raphael's done the same for uh, a few years now, but we, we have high hopes for him. Thank you. Make us pull our hair out too with your design sometimes. <laughs> so it goes both ways. That's so true. Yeah, yeah great, great to hear. I'm the opposite. I've used Tableau significantly more than Figma. And uh, I would love to get more involved with Figma. And it definitely seems a lot more intuitive. I've struggled with, uh, you know, kind of like doing animations and doing like uh, time series in Tableau. It's just not intuitive. Uh, and then you have the uh, mobile uh, incompatibility where most designers just end up deleting the. <laughs> totally. Um, yeah. But. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get to you in order. While nobody's raising their hand, I think also something to mention, all of the softwares that we mentioned, Altrix, Tableau, and Figma. Figma by standard is free anyway with the normal license, but also Altrix, while you guys are students, you can get all tricks for free, which is normally like five, uh, five or six thousand dollars. So definitely make use of that. Tableau the same. If you have an email address that is .edu, you can get the Tableau full version for free for as long as you are a student. Yeah, that's a, that's yeah. a huge benefit. And uh, Tableau Public, I believe, is free anyway. So uh, definitely an option to consider even once you graduate. Definitely. And I also think as long as you keep your EDU email address for a while, you can still have the Tableau after you graduate for another year, I want to say. All right. Um, if uh, folks from Playfair, if you have any uh, news updates, information to share with the students, uh, feel free to go ahead, uh, whether that's about uh, you know, changes within Playfair or anything you want to communicate to them. Yeah, I mean, I guess I can speak on um, Playfair data. We just recently started uh, rolling out uh, internship programs and we have a range of positions from uh, engineer data to uh, visual analytics designers. Um, so right now, this summer is going to be the first time that we're actually opening up to internships. It is uh, right now, it would be our first attempt at creating an internship. So there's a lot that we're still learning in the process, uh, but we do still have like a clear idea of what the kind of people that we're looking for. We mainly want to make this an opportunity for students to learn more than trying to come into the internship necessarily showing like four years of experience. We really, the requirements that we ask is that you know, you want to work, and this is something interested that you want to come into. Uh, but other than that, you know, if you haven't gotten a chance to look into our internship uh, opportunities, if they've gotten fill, filled up already, it is something that we're potentially looking to do on a yearly basis, not necessarily restricted to the summer, but it might be something ongoing that every semester or every quarter we're going to have uh, interns position opening. So if you're ever interested, if you're a student, whether it is about to graduate or uh, doing a graduate program and you're interested in maybe getting into the world of data visualization, uh, definitely check out our website. We post there pretty uh, regularly if there's any open positions that you might wanna try. Yeah, I think also LinkedIn, all of us have LinkedIn profiles. If you come across any questions you have or follow-up items, um, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. I use that a lot. I created an initiative actually for students to get into the data world, make it a little bit easier for them. Um, if you guys need help, maybe your type of public profile or with Figma, I, mean, I would hand that over to Jason and Rafa, but um, we're, we're super open in helping as long as it's like not our whole day, but um, <laughs> definitely um, reach out 
I mean, this starting a career is not easy, um, especially when HR requires you to have three to five years of experience in something. So we can trick, we can help um, with resources that we have that we can share with, that is part of the data community um, that are pretty open. Yeah. And I think you guys kind of heard it too from the beginning. I mean, we've all got kind of different backgrounds. So, you know, I think it's one of those things you, I think people find their, their way to data and data visualization from, you know, any number of different directions. So it's really about being flexible, being, you know, curious. Um, and, you know, like we've said a few times now, it's, it's a team effort. I mean, no one person um, is going to be able to do all these different things together. It's, it's really about, you know, working with somebody, understanding something, asking questions, you know, being vulnerable and brave um, and, and trying to understand something that maybe is quite complex and difficult. So um, I think that those are important skills, probably, you know, in some cases, especially for our internship, um, even more so. Um, are you able to come into a team and work efficiently and get along with everybody and um, add something to it and be brave enough to kind of step in and, and you know, put your two cents out there um, uh, with a bunch of folks that, you know, are all kind of after the same thing. I think that's such an important piece. And I think it's, I think everybody would agree on the, on the call today. That's really what's made Playfair special. It's what makes, you know, what we do different. Um, it's the team. And you know all these tools are available for free, so it's it's not that um, it's skills that we bring, and more importantly, it's the skills that we bring together. Yeah, and Jason touched on an important topic. I think you know having a lot of hard skills and knowing a lot of you know technology and technology stacks and different softwares that, that's great, but I do think that. In this industry, the most important thing is those soft skills, uh, being able to communicate um, with others, being able to collaborate. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I saw, you know, people coming into the industry and they would get a business problem and they they focus in on that and they they run towards it and then they present it to someone and they're like, what is that? That has nothing to do with what we were talking about. Um, so you have to be able to communicate with your stakeholders and you know, um, those soft skills, in my opinion, are a lot more important at the end of the day than those hard skills. Um, it's very easy to teach someone a hard skill learning a new technology, um, but it's it's more difficult to teach someone those interpersonal uh, soft skills. Um, so that's definitely something I would recommend working on or, or looking at. Um, even on your resume, you know, highlight those things, even above some of those hard skills, I would say. Um, when you're building out resumes and, and applying for jobs. Yeah, just one last little tidbit just to build on that. I mean, a lot of times because of the, the nature of the data we're working with, I mean, we, we aren't, we a lot of times are in one-on-one -on -one communication with like a CEO or a president or a vice president of a company. So, you know, it's, it's you have to be ready for that kind of interaction. Um, and that can be very daunting, I think. Um, you know, when you sit down with a CEO, somebody who's responsible for an entire company and, and millions, if not billions of dollars, um, you know, you just want to make sure you're making the most of that 30 minute meeting that you've got. And, you know, I find that way more difficult than, you know, trying to figure out a new design or, or UI UX thing or, or even getting into Tableau. So I think, you know, those are things that you don't think about that often. And, and any way you can highlight those things is really important. Great. Uh, thank you, Jason, Ethan, Raphael, and Maggie. It was a pleasure having you. I believe some of you have a, a hard stop at six. So in the interest of time, we'll be wrapping up. Uh, I'll now hand over to Danielle to do the closing. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, joining the conversation. Uh, I really appreciate that last piece about soft skills. I'll echo that across all industries. Uh, employers are looking at soft skills a lot more than, than they have in the past. And so um, definitely something to think about and a plug for the Career Center if you need some help with that. We also provide some services in terms of advising. So thank you again to all the panelists. Uh, thank you to Kelly for doing an excellent job moderating the panel. And uh, I'll be sending out some information uh, for Playfair, the internship information, as well as their LinkedIn and a link to the recording uh, in the email. So please keep an eye out for that. And uh, everyone have a wonderful evening. Yeah, appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank it. You. Bye. Thank you.